Hello, everyone, and welcome to Health Reform Beyond the Basics. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on Introduction to Plan Selection Tools for 2024. My name is Isad Odiale, and I'm the Health Projects Assistant at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Beyond the Basics is a project of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. It's designed to provide training and resources to facilitate enrollment in the ACA health insurance marketplaces and Medicaid. The Center on Budget and Policy Priorities is a nonprofit policy organization. We are not a part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Beyond the Basics is aimed at healthcare sisters, advocates, state and local officials, and others who help people get and keep their health coverage. This webinar is not intended for press purposes, and while we hope you will learn a lot, we are not able to offer continuing education credit for our webinars at this time. Here you can see our upcoming webinars. As a follow-up to today's presentation, we'll be hosting part two under the hood, building your own plan selection tools for 2024 on August 16th. We're also excited to give you a sneak peek of the dates and topics for our annual fall webinar series. We'll cover all the core concepts we always do, like determining household size and income, premium tax credit eligibility, and resolving data matching issues. And we're also adding some new content on immigrant eligibility, and are pleased to once again be hosting a webinar in Spanish that focuses on enrollment issues most relevant for people who are immigrants and people who live in mixed immigration status households. After the webinar, we'll circulate the slides, a video recording of this presentation and other resources. We'll also post everything to the Beyond the Basics website. Automated captions have been enabled for this webinar. To view them, click on the show captions icon, the one with the two Cs, in the meeting controls toolbar at the bottom of your screen. All participants are muted and in listen only mode. If you'd like to ask a question, click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your webinar screen and type your question into the box. We will be monitoring questions and we'll pause for Q&A during the presentation. We may not be able to answer every question asked, but, but we will have a record of all your questions and we'll use them as a guide for future resources and presentations. You can also email your questions during and after the webinar to beyondthebasics at cdpp.org. And a quick reminder, you won't be able to click on your screen to go to any link shared in the deck, but we've put a link to, I'm going to put a link to all the slides in the chat where you can find active links to everything shared today. After today's webinar, we'll email a recording of this presentation along with the links and other resources. We'll also, again, post everything to the Beyond the Basics website. So in today's webinar, Jenny Sullivan will provide an overview of the 2024 marketplace landscape. And then Ariana Anaya will cover planning for fall open enrollment, resource building, and using easy pricing plans to examine specific materials. And so first, I'll turn it over to Jenny. Great, great. Thank you so much, ISAD, and thanks to everybody for joining us this afternoon. Um, we'll spend most of our time today hearing from Ari about enrollment and plan comparison tools. But first, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the marketplace landscape going into the fall open enrollment period. So we've got four main um, themes going into the 2024 open enrollment period. First, we have record enrollment in 2023. For the third year in a row, that we had record enrollment in marketplace plan selections. There were more than 16.3 million people who enrolled in a marketplace plan for this year. And this past year also saw a record number of new marketplace enrollees. And that was for the second year in a row, um, making a record. Um, nearly 3.7 million people enrolled in a marketplace plan for 2023 who weren't enrolled the year before. Plus, we know that there will be additional new enrollees who have come in throughout the year, which there are every year, but this year in particular, due to Medicaid unwinding, which we'll talk more about in a moment. 
And just to note that we know a lot of this growth is connected to the enhanced premium tax credit that has been in effect since 2021. 90% of marketplace enrollees are receiving PTCs, as we call them, to lower their costs of premiums this year. And those enhancements will remain in place in 2024 and 2025, at least. Now, of course, the biggest coverage news of the year is the end of Medicaid continuous coverage. Medicaid redeterminations and terminations have resumed in nearly every state. This process, which we sometimes call Medicaid unwinding, will continue through the middle of 2024. So far, a staggering 3.7 million people have lost Medicaid, and an estimated three quarters of these terminations were procedural, which means many of them are likely still eligible for Medicaid. We just haven't engaged with them to know exactly what they are still eligible for or not. Now, people who aren't um, eligible for Medicaid or CHIP anymore will qualify for a special enrollment period to enroll in marketplace coverage, as I hope most of you know by now. Um, in healthcare.gov states, this special enrollment period is available anytime through July of 2024, regardless of when the person lost Medicaid or CHIP. In states with state-based marketplaces, the policies vary. Now, some people who are no longer eligible for Medicaid will qualify for employer-based coverage instead. Um, as you know, navigating these transitions can be very complex, so your work continues to be critical. There are some new rules about marketplace plan design that take effect for 2024, which we'll cover in greater detail in our fall series that starts in September. But just to quickly touch on those, we will have the continued availability of so-called easy pricing plans on healthcare.gov. These are standardized plans that provide certain services pre-deductible and have standardized cost sharing amounts. Plans have to continue to offer standardized plans in every metal tier that they offer non-standardized plans other than the non-expanded bronze tier. And if you don't understand that, don't sweat it. We'll get into some of that later today as well. Um, insurers will also only be able to offer four non-standardized plans per product network type at each metal level in 2024. Now, the TLDR on that is we may see a modest reduction in the total number of plans available for folks to choose from, but it won't be dramatic and it may not look particularly different at all. Um, finally, HHS is also requiring that plan names no longer include inaccurate or misleading information. For example, silver $0 copay when the plan actually does have copays or plans with HSA in the title that don't in fact have a health savings account component. All right, last thing on the near horizon and very exciting news, we do expect that HHS will finalize a rule that they proposed earlier this year that would make Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or DACA recipients newly eligible for Medicaid and premium tax credits. If finalized as proposed, an estimated 129,000 previously uninsured DACA recipients would be newly eligible for health coverage through Medicaid, CHIP, the basic health program, or the AC8 marketplaces. All right, um, so what should you be doing now? There's the landscape. What are some actions to keep in mind during um, the, the dog days of summer? First, continue to focus on clear and simple messages for people affected by Medicaid redeterminations. Enrollment assisters are crucial not only to helping people navigate the process and get back into Medicaid if they have been procedurally denied, but also to spotting problems with the system and sharing those with relevant state and national decision makers. We have really appreciated, I can say personally, all, I really have appreciated the emails that I've gotten um, to hear how it's going um, in, in the places where you are. And I hope that more of you will reach out in the coming weeks and months your eyes and ears on the ground, combined with your deep knowledge of how these programs should work, are really key to identifying and correcting problems with systems early so that fewer people are harmed by them. And if you should have the unfortunate circumstance of assisting someone affected by a systems issue during unwinding, we also really want to encourage you to be collecting those stories. If your organization doesn't have a way to collect stories, um, consider identifying other organizations in your state that do and partnering with them because collecting and, and measuring and showing the impact of some of these systems failures is going to be really critical um, to, to ensuring that we mitigate them as quickly as possible. Second, as I mentioned earlier, many people currently enrolled in the marketplace have never experienced the enrollment process before, so they may have no idea why they should return to the marketplace and actively compare their options for 2024. 
We say this every year, but it, it remains true going into the next this next year. We have to continue to push the message that uh, active re-enrollment is critical. Um, however, it is also worth noting that in 2024, in healthcare.gov states, the marketplace will be re-enrolling people eligible for cost sharing reductions. If we had a bronze level plan in 2023, they'll be re-enrolling them in a silver level plan with the same carrier, same plan type, and same provider network if there's a silver plan available for the same or lower premium than their 2023 bronze plan. Um, this will help ensure that more people who qualify for cost sharing reductions actually receive those benefits. Third course, and this is critical to today's topic, look into what's going on in your state's ACA marketplace insurance market for 2024. Rate filings are beginning to become public now, and they will continue to roll out over the next couple of months. Keep an eye on whether premiums are changing or increasing significantly, um, are more or fewer issuers participating in your area, because of course you're going to need to know that um, come, come the start of open enrollment. And then finally, the reason you're here today, um, you can begin to create or iterate on any existing wireframes you have for plan comparison tools you want to use starting in, in November. You probably won't have access to detailed plan data until open enrollment starts or very close to that date, but now is the time to figure out what's working well that you want to continue, what new tools or resources would make your job easier this fall. Um, Ariana has a lot of great ideas to get you thinking about this, and so now I'm going to turn it back to ISET to introduce Ariana. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to our guest presenter, Ariana Anaya. Ariana is an adjunct English instructor at Norwich University in Vermont, and she previously served as a certified application counselor, community health worker, and navigator in Texas and Illinois between 2014 and 2022. Take it away, Ari. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank all of you for being here today. This is one of my great joys getting to do this presentation, but it was originally scheduled for last week and connected to some flooding that I'm sure y'all have encountered on the news. I was, I was not able to be available. So thank you all so much for being here and I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Or I think I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so something that we had talked about in a previous year, um, I want to say around this time last year, was building resources in a thoughtful way. And I wanted to review some of the items that we've landed on for people who are brand new, but also for those of you who may have liked the ideas but simply didn't have bandwidth to get to building resources given all the millions of other things that you guys have to do in preparation for an open enrollment period and for year-round enrollment. So quickly, we had three sort of themes or points from which to consider a resource once you get building. The first of those is audience. The second is function. And then finally, focus. What is the focus of that resource? I'm going to pull an illustration in just a second, but I think what's most important for us to reiterate is that audience and function will be best in a resource when they do what I'm going to call double duty. When they possess, let's say, information or instructions for the assister that is almost separate from what it contains for the client or the enrollee or whatever you refer to your body of persons who you are assisting with enrollment. I tend towards the use of the word assister to talk about the certified application counselor or the navigator and client to talk about the potential enrollee, the person who's being assisted. So for both audience and function, as much as possible, you want to design your resources to speak to both the assister and the client when it comes to audience. And you want them to have a kind of dual functionality as well. They should be instructive, meaning there's information, there's something to learn. But they should, excuse me, let me flip that. They should be informative, meaning that there's kind of a lesson to them, but also instructive. And what we've observed with technology kind of taking over everything is that there are fewer and fewer set documents that give people a step-by-step -step 
how to instruction. And that's really, really hard with websites. Finally, when it comes to focus, you want to ignore the double duty advice that we're giving connected to audience and function. And you want to pick a specific point in time at which a resource becomes useful for both the assister and the client. So if we divide the process up into three steps, which is of course kind of problematic, but go with me, it's best if each resource is focused on one point in the process. And so the way I like to talk about it has to do with eligibility. Basically, when you first sit down with a client and try to figure out if they're even a candidate for your services or for the marketplace or for Medicaid or for food stamps or whatever you're assisting them with. Then there's the actual application, which is, of course, a beast of its own. And then lastly, plan selection which is where I tend to spend the most time, where we will mostly spend our time today. So this illustration, which it's very possible I designed, but I feel like somebody with better design skills actually put it together, kind of shows you that with audience and function, you wanna hit that sort of happy medium. You wanna hit that overlap point, make it useful to your sister, and they are going to find it more useful and more likely that they will share information with the client. So there's a good cycle to that. Likewise, just giving someone instructions that they don't necessarily understand is sometimes important, but mostly, what is the expression about teaching a man to fish? You know, if you teach him to fish, wait, oh man, I'm doing bad with instructions today. But anyway, <laughs> give information as you give instructions and you will breed better learning in your learner basically forever. My final illustration separates the three facets of what we do when we assist someone with an application for healthcare.gov. There is, of course, the first step of determining whether someone is eligible. There is the second very complicated step of filling out the actual application. And then finally, if you're doing healthcare.gov or state-based exchange enrollment, there's a whole final step <laughs> of plan selection, which of course, is what we will spend a lot of time on today. So I'm going to actually call myself out because I'm one of the people responsible for this chart. And I think this chart is important. I have bragged about this chart in many, many different contexts because I uh, messed around with it and helped make it what it is. But I would say functionally and fundamentally, you should have maybe one resource that looks like this, and it should probably be your FPL chart. The reason is that this chart is not very helpful for someone who doesn't have a ton of information already about healthcare.gov and the financial assistance it offers. This is a very, this is a complicated document. And if you know how to read it, good for you, but it probably is going to only be helpful to people who already have a lot of information. So accordingly, the audience here is much more the assister than the client. And the function of this is much more that it's informational rather than in any way, shape or form offering instruction. The final piece that makes this a type of research resource that you need but probably don't wanna replicate all that often, is that this chart is necessary at every single stage of, of your focus when you're attempting to assist someone. And that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because it might mean that there was a conversation that needed to happen with a client earlier that you wind up having during plan selection because what this means and whether someone estimates an income of 20,000 versus 30,000, right, might be a little bit confusing. So this is something that's kind of, I don't wanna say a necessary evil, but I guess I just did. We need charts like this, but we also need to ensure that most of our other resources have more accessibility to them. Now, not to call Center on Budget out at all, because Beyond the Base Takes is my dear, dear favored employer at the moment, <laughs> but this too is a resource that kind of replicates some of those, let's say, myopic elements. 
it has wonderful information, but it's wonderful information for someone such as myself who can zero in exactly to the point that's most important to them. A client who's new to the ACA will not be able to do much with this. And it's the kind of thing that if a client wants a copy of it, by all means, give it to them but it may not serve them very well. It's intended for a very broad audience of people across the country. It's not necessarily intended to help one individual figure out their options. Okay, so I'm gonna do a quick review of how a different type of resource may do this double duty role that we're hoping for when it comes to audience and function, um, but how the, the focus shifts. So this resource I think is one of my favorites. Y'all can see that it's 10 pages long, <laughs> which I find kind of hurtful, but this is something that is so useful when someone is a new assister. It is useful also to a client who needs confirmation first from the assister, but also from something that looks official, that they are eligible to be where they are and to do what they're doing. My last job doing enrollment was in Texas, and I was so often in my terrible, embarrassing Spanish, trying to convince certain immigrants that they were eligible, that their kids were eligible. My bad Spanish didn't help, but what did help were references like this. It also enabled me as an assister to sort of fact check my own knowledge to make sure I was using the right name for things. One thing I'll call your attention to is that green circle where it says USCIS number. That has been called a variety of different things. And the chart explains that. It says this is the alien number, right? Which I think hopefully we move away from calling certain types of people aliens in this day and age, right? So, but an older immigrant may know that as their alien number and their card might look different than this. So to my mind, this is the type of resource which though sometimes painful to get information from, you can actually look at with a client and ensure that you and the client are on the same page when it comes to their status and their eligibility. And that of course enables this to be an eligibility focused resource. Another, another beyond the basics resource that I think is very helpful and brings us into the application is the fact that sometimes a individual will fail identity verification right off the bat, no matter what you do. Often this is someone who doesn't have a long credit history or any credit history in the US. Sometimes it just has to do with something silly like a name change or some, just something you wouldn't expect. But what this resource does is it essentially helps you, the assister, but also if you're working with a young and savvy client, this could be given to them to get the steps going so that the person has appropriately submitted the documents necessary to demonstrate their identity and to enable them to enroll. So I would call this double duty in that the assister is usually the targeted individual for this resource, but that showing the client that this isn't a problem, they're not in trouble, they didn't do anything wrong, right? This is just a bureaucratic step that we're gonna work around together. And this is why this has that double duty to an extent when it comes to audience, but also even though it's instructive and step-by-step, -step, I think it guides the client and the assister towards a process that is sort of thus double duty when it comes to function. And of course, because this is the very first step in completing an application, this is focused on the application step. Finally, a resource that I hope all of you make use of. These are linked in the right-hand corner of the screen. Thank you, Isa, for doing that. That looks way better than where I put it. <laughs> this is a resource that's actually a fillable PDF, but you can also print it and fill it out by hand with the client. This is something I would recommend if you hit a point at plan selection where the client just needs to go home and think a little bit. We're all, I think, very motivated by enrollment. We have to be when we're assisters. 
but there is only so much information a person can absorb within the space of an hour, <laughs> even within the space of a day. And sometimes a client genuinely needs to step away to make a decision. And this resource is very double duty in that it can, it can be a means to an end. It can be a space where information is filled out by you or the client if they are able. It can be done on your computer and emailed to a tech savvy client. It can be done with pen and paper and given to them if they want something to take away. But it also contains these sort of enrollment plus elements where definitions of these technical terms that the client may not know are available, as well as certain tips. I think why an assister might avoid this is because it is a lot. And to that, I would just say, use it exactly as much as you need. The client might be comparing two options and that's it. You don't have to fill out all four columns just because there are four columns. A client might be concerned only about the deductible and out-of-pocket max. If that's the case, you don't have to fill out what the cost for a PCP or specialist visit is. So use this as much as it is useful. And keep in mind that this type of resource has to work across every <laughs> enrollment situation in the world. This has really been built to work in a broad sense. And if you guys can remake this to work more specifically for your organization, I am sure Beyond the Basics would have no issue with that. Oh, it's also in a ton of different languages. I can't rattle them off, but this is, this is available in linked eight languages, it is. So that's available to y'all. Okay, so we're gonna stop talking about the, the three sort of forms or functions of the resource and talk specifically about network overview resources. I was very lucky to do a couple of individual presentations for different states and different cities and different states this past open enrollment. And that's always something I will offer. But what you're looking at right now is a resource that I had help putting together for foundation communities, which is the nonprofit that I worked for in Austin, Texas. Hopefully some of my former coworkers are on the call. <laughs> But this is something that we have made available. It's currently an Excel spreadsheet, but for anyone who doesn't have Excel, you can always use Google, Google Sheets, I wanna say it's called, to replicate this. So looking from left to right, you have the names of the different health insurance companies. And then looking up and down, you have information on each that in theory would help you when it comes to the plan selection stage, where you're able to get essentially an overview, a high level overview of what your market looks like in a given year. So we went usually a little bit too far with it or just far enough, depending on what the sisters will tell you. Um, but what I wanna call your attention to is if we're looking at the Friday column, Friday was a new insurance company for the Austin area the year that this was built. And so there were a couple providers, Lone Star Circle of Care, People's Community Clinic and Red River pra Family Practice, that when I was doing the exhaustive <laughs> research on whether they would be in network with Friday, I could not get a good answer from either Friday or the clinics because the contract was still in progress. So this is going to happen very often. When an insurer is new to an area, it is often hard to get definitive information that will sue the client sufficiently. But it is okay to have within your network cheat sheets or overviews this type of information where the suggestion is, we've heard that they will be but we can't confirm that now. That's okay. That is the nature, unfortunately, of our work is that it's often in flux and it can change. Finally, so you can see, God, I'm just remembering what a nightmare. So 2021, we had six insurers. Easy peasy, right? No, still kind of a lot. But then 2022, what did we have? Like 12? <laughs> I don't know. I know they have 12 now. This meant I had to entirely flip the chart because it just simply couldn't work on the same axes. Um, and I sometimes regret how into the weeds I went with these because I think they became overwhelming to look at. You guys remember what I said earlier about the 
the FPL chart and how that should really be your one resource that is that painful to look at. And unfortunately, I think when I had to up it for 2022, I made this really painful to look at. But one thing I am proud of and one thing that we carried over from 2021 is this red scary reminder in the middle, which is really much more there for the assisters, reminding them that we may say to a client 1600 times, if you go out of network for a life-threatening emergency, it's covered. The realities of what will happen when someone goes out of network for a life-threatening emergency are a little bit more complicated than that. So having that have a prominent place on a resource that all your assisters are looking at can be very helpful. And I would recommend keeping in mind, what is that number one takeaway? If you're building a resource that contains this much information, what is the thing that should be in a big fat shiny box across everything? Again, had to go a bit wide with the different providers. I, I feel like I was looking at what my former team has done with this sheet previous since I've been gone and it looks a lot better. But again, we didn't have a ton of information on certain newer providers. And so you'll see with this last, oh, where is it? This last horror show <laughs> um, to be determined that gray and red part where we couldn't for love or money find out definitive information on this, but we know one thing and one thing that can be communicated to clients is they have to offer these services. They can't just not offer them. So if this plan meets your needs in all other respects and you have a hard time finding out where to do imaging or labs or urgent cares, be back in touch with us after the fact. So, Linked here is a blank version of that earlier, less um, massive template. So I would say this is for those of you who have six issuers or less, because of course it's easier to change, to delete a column than it is to add a row. So you can make use of this if you wish. And then we also have linked the kind of more fugly version for those of you with more than six plan issuers, or again, in theory, you could add as many rows as you needed to this. And that's going to include some of the, the, the I guess, the different tabs on the panel that you could use to list different providers. And this will all depend on where you're working. I'm right now in Vermont. And there's really only one hospital for me to look up. <laughs> it's a much simpler landscape because it's a smaller area. Okay, should I pause for questions or keep going? I feel like I should keep going, but feel free to interrupt me anyone if I should pause. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about easy pricing plans, which are also called standardized plans. What's important to be aware of, um, standardized plans or easy pricing plans on the marketplace have kind of come back for 2023. And for all intents and purposes, I believe they will be around again for 2024. Um, we're gonna talk about how these plans are helpful in theory, especially for those of you with big markets when it comes to helping a client with plan selection. So what we're looking at right now is from HHS, and it basically gives what standardized plans are required to set certain cost sharing rates at. So you can see, again, looking at the, the top most row field, the actuarial value of the plan, which is that sort of mythic, strange percentage that no one ever feels able to make total sense of. We're going to focus today on looking at plans in the silver 87% category. So just briefly, I'll call your attention to the fact that if a plan is one of these easy pricing plans and is at the 87% cost sharing, primary care visits have to be $20, specialist visits have to be $40, and skipping ahead, generic medications have to have a $10 copay, all right? There's more information there, but we're gonna look at those specific values. 
So here I am in Austin, Texas. <laughs> um, I'm 38 years old. I have 20,000. Okay, so just to be clear, this is maybe me or maybe not me. This is just my example person. But once I do my C plans, C plans and prices search, I um, end up looking at a screen like this. It tells me that I have 126 plans to choose from. Holy moly. And of those 126 plans, I have 40 bronze, 51 silver, and 35 gold. This would upset me if it was food in my fridge. <laughs> and that I love. I love food. To imagine that someone has to approach healthcare plans with this many options is very intimidating. It's a lot. So what I'm going to do to start is I'm going to choose that filter option and I'm going to filter for silver, but then just to save myself even more time, I'm going to filter for those easy pricing plans. All right, this is the least expensive plan offered in Austin, Texas. I wanna say I use the zip code 78752. I don't quite remember for my 38 year old who is earning $25,000 a year. So um, you guys can see $800 deductible, $3,000 out of pocket max. Primary visits 20, specialist visits 40. Generic drugs, 10. So this should look familiar, eh? We just saw it. So now because I filtered for the easy pricing plans, I'm going to pull up the Aetna plan. Aetna's plan is not the least expensive, but it's close to least expensive. And we can see again, the deductible out-of-pocket max primary specialist and generic are identical to the Baylor Scott and White plan. Same with Ascension and same with Moda. So the big thing changing here is the price of each plan, right? And so clearly it's not necessarily helpful for someone who has, let's say $30 to spend on a health plan. Yeah, great. All four of these plans have the exact same cost sharing, but how can that help me pick a plan if, for example, my budget is $70? Okay. So what I do in this circumstance, let's say that I need to build my own cheat sheet just to help this one individual get going. So I'm going to pivot back to my first least expensive plan, and I'm going to build myself a quick sheet, cheat sheet using the least expensive silver easy pricing plans. So you guys can see where that HMO information, the plan type is listed. I will let you guys know that there are some HMOs that don't require a referral to see a specialist. Not a bad idea to double check that in the plan summary of benefits, but Scott and White, I do not believe is one of those exceptions, nor is Aetna. Now, just so I'm giving myself some other mode of comparison, I've actually entered the three big hospitals in the Austin area into the marketplaces specific find a medical provider thing. Be aware, this doesn't always work very well. And I'm sure that's the feedback I'm going to get. And the reason for that is what's being searched in the medical provider database is everything everywhere. So if you don't get the name quite right, or if you select something that sounds familiar, but for whatever reason isn't in fact representative of that hospital system, it may not work well. So I'm going to say trust, but verify, okay? Confirm this in another way after you've made this cheat sheet for yourself once. But Scott and White is in network with Baylor Scott and White Hospital, which makes sense, and is not in network with St. David's or Seton Ascension. So I did this also with my other two least expensive easy pricing plan. All right, so having done that, I'm going to just look at my silver plans. So my least expensive plan is still that easy pricing plan. Now my second least expensive plan, dun, 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 also offered by Baylor Scott and White, which is very interesting, okay? I'm deeply, my teacher nature makes me really wanna ask questions here, but I, I can't do that. So I'll just give answers. 
there is a world in which it would make a lot more sense for the client to just pick the least expensive plan. If the client says to you, honestly, I'd really like the least expensive silver plan, they have they should certainly go with that $20.08 Baylor Scott and White. But what if this client says to you, listen, I take four medications a, a month. Um, they're all generic. Is $40 a month for generic? Is that my best bet? $40 a month for medication is not bad, but if we look at our second option, right? Scott and White is now competing to an extent against their own standardized plan. They want clients to go into the buy-up. They want clients to go into the slightly more expensive plan. So they've got to make it worth their while. And they've done this by lowering the costs of primary visits, specialist visits, and generic medications. So for eight extra bucks a month, I would probably recommend that a client who sees a primary doctor regularly or has generic medications they fill probably wants to look at option number two, the second least expensive plans. So accordingly, what this easy pricing plan business has done is it has given us the ability to compare the other options within a given meta level to the easy pricing plan of each company. And I'll show you guys this again with Aetna. So Aetna is offering the third least expensive plan in the Austin area. And we can again see how those, the cost sharing parts are standardized. 80, excuse me, $800 deductible, $3,000 out-of-pocket max, 20 bucks for primary, 40 bucks for specialist, $10 for generic meds. So yet again, we have Aetna kind of competing with themselves. Aetna doesn't get to design the easy pricing plan. HHS does, yeah? So what Aetna wants is to charge a little more money for health insurance, right? Sure, why not? That's how they make their money. <laughs> so what they've done is they've tweaked a little bit the standardized plans. Specifically, we can see that there's a slightly lower out-of-pocket max, a slightly higher deductible, and they've left primary and specialist doctor visits exactly the same. So they're putting all their tweaking into generic meds. So let's say the client who you were working with said, well, yeah, the Scott and White plan was fine, but I'd really like to have access to either St. David's or Seton Ascension. This might be the better option for them. That's $65.37, um, $65.37 Aetna plan is probably going to work a little better for them financially than that least expensive, easy pricing plan. So it's, it's really almost as though HHS has given us a way to compare plans within a given metal level and company. We can sort of pit the easy pricing plan against the standard, the non-standardized plan and use those pieces of data to help the client really make a wonderful and informed financial decision. Again, I'm tempted to pause, but I feel like I've got five minutes, I'm doing it. Okay, so briefly, I do wanna talk about state-based exchanges because it's a little more complicated. I myself tried to take a look at how um, standardized plans look in the Vermont market, and I spent way too much time trying to hack this before I realized they're not always labeled very clearly. But here's a little cheat sheet in terms of, for example, if you're in Maine, clear choice is how these standardized plans are called, right? You can see that in California, Washington, D.C., only standardized plans are offered. So you might be looking for something that doesn't exist. I myself am enrolled currently in a Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont plan. Um, actually, I'm in a bronze plan and I love it. It's great. But when I casually went back to look and see if I could spot what were the easy pricing plans, I could not figure it out. And it's kind of my job to figure this out. Like I had hours to sit and mess with it. So finally, I found this. <laughs> Do you see this? <laughs> I wanna meet the person who built this because me and them are soulmates, but I also would like to tell them off because this is really hard. And I found this last open enrollment when I was signing up and actually reworked it 
So it would make sense to me because bless the heart of whoever built this thing. And I'm, let me just show you that horror show one more time. It's too much. It's simply too much information. So I was actually going through and I found that there are, you know, the standardized plans. The only person who would know they're standardized are basically the insurance company and Vermont Health Connect, which is our state-based exchange up here. So I had to actually distill it down into more sensible information for myself so I could pick a plan. It is the most outrageous. Now, it's the most incredible document I've ever seen, but for someone who doesn't do this for a living, it could be a little intimidating. So if any of you are struggling with your state-based exchanges and trying to figure out, is there an easy pricing plan availability and can I use it to explain things, feel free to be in touch with me or Center on Budget because I think by design, certain state-based exchanges intend the plans to kind of blend in with all the other plans. And that's not a bad thing at all. It's just different. Okay. Um, am I gonna yeah. pause? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you, Ari. Um, great presentation. We have a good amount of questions from everything you just said. So we're going to start off with, do you know where we can locate the list of issuers for 2024 for our state? It is very hard. I would say you're a little early, unfortunately. You can probably start to hear rumors um, all, all different kinds of ways. I would ask you to email me because I'd love to try and hack that. But again, insurance companies do not have to really release their plans until a certain point in time. And they're often working right up until that point to finalize contracts and to get everything kind of all the ducks in a row. So I would be surprised to learn that a list exists for any state at this time, unless you've had a very stagnant market and it's just gonna be the same issuers that have been there you know, for years, it ten, it'll come up, but I think July is still a little early. I think August is even still a little early, but feel free to be in touch with me or center on budget if I can try to see what I can find. Great, thank you. And another question, when you are looking up coverage, are you contacting issuers or are you contacting the hospital, clinic, et cetera, to see what insurance is accepted? So it depends when I build the resource. If I'm building the resource in the middle of the year like this, I will contact providers. I have a, I've had a running list when I worked out of Texas of who the contract person is in a given office. And they, they learn me, they know I'm gonna come knocking <laughs> and it, it becomes more of a relational element than just, hey, give me information, because sometimes they have questions I can answer too. So I would say, again, my I'm going to pivot to saying trust but verify. The information is available on healthcare.gov. You just have to ensure that your mode of looking it up and confirming it work well. I would always say, you know, what do they say? Cut, cut once, but measure twice. Okay, so reverse that. I would say use healthcare.gov as your first source of information and find a secondary way to confirm it. I can give all different types of tips and tricks depending on what's working for you and the size of your market. So if you ever run into difficulties with that, please, please, please center on budget or myself. We, we love to help with it. Awesome. And another question, Experience is that consumers better understand dollar amounts as co-pays, but are there situations when percentage co-ins is better for them? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. I think that it would depend, of course, on the cost sharing structure of their plan, right? So my theoretical answer is very much predicated on someone who, let's say, is exceedingly low income, right? And let's say they have picked a plan where they have a $600 deductible and a $600 out-of-pocket max. In that respect, I would say there's value to the client. Let's say they've got a ton of medical needs, just hitting that deductible ASAP without, you know, going copay after copay for gosh knows how long. Because the sooner they hit the deductible, the sooner they've hit their max, and then the sooner they don't have to pay anything, right? But 
I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it, there's a clear cut way to say that one is better than the other, just because everyone's situation is so specific, right? Everyone is someone just seeing your, their primary or their mental health counselor several times a month, or is someone getting infusions as cancer treatment, right? There's, it all just comes, it comes down to network and cash flow, I think, when we're talking about health insurance. And there's just no, there's no one size fits all because people's medical situations and financial situations are so unique. Yes, thank you. We have a few more really good questions. Um, this one is based on slide 35. It said, what about Tennessee? What is the best way to see what the differences are in state and the plan details? Example, like what each carrier is compared to another state like and better Missouri to and better Tennessee. Sorry, I hope that explained that question right. Yeah, so I'm assuming that Tennessee is a state-based exchange off the top of my head. I don't know the answer to that. Um, did you say the difference or it comparing and better plans in Tennessee to and better plans in Missouri? Yes. Um, I think that you know, this again, kind of a hard question to answer. Missouri, as far as I know, is still using health. No, Missouri switched, didn't they? Maybe I'll get you to email me because this is a question I can really go into the weeds on. Um, but I would say generally, you know, comparing a plan offered in one state to the same company plan offered in another, um, the only situation I can envision that being useful in is someone who like snow bunnies, somebody who let's say lives in, I don't know, Vermont in the summer and then goes down to Florida in the winter, because that's a life change event that enables you to swap your coverage. And so I could see in theory of value in wanting to, you know, let's say you have Blue Cross Blue Shield in Vermont, you probably want to maintain it in, um, I mean, I don't even know if you do want to maintain it in Florida, but I'm not sure what I would see as the value of comparing um, a plan within a state to a plan within another state, just because you can't get it unless you live in that other state, right? But maybe maybe email me so I'm so I'm answering your question fully because I don't know that I understand it. We're gonna just do a couple more questions. So this one question: Deductible reads health and drugs. Do the zero dollar generics come after deductible? It, it'll depend. Um, usually, it, it should say. It should say specifically whether the drug deductible applies. I'm tempted to go back a few slides, but I'm worried I'll mess us up. Um, generally speaking, and I'm knocking on all the wood, a generic drug is generally pre-deductible, but the summary of benefits should specialize should specify that. Usually when there is a drug deductible on a plan, it usually is gonna apply to medications that are covered with a coinsurance or medications of a higher tier. But that that is not always accurate at all. So I would say double check the summary of benefits. And this last question that we're going to answer live today, is can you share some tips for plan selection for people with a lot of medical needs, medicines and visits to the doctor? What would be the best option, a silver or a gold plan? That'll depend on their income. If their income, I mean, just going back to the actuary value of a given plan, um, a gold plan is not necessarily quote unquote, as good from an actuary standpoint as a silver plan, if someone is getting 06 or 05 cost sharing reductions. So there is a situation in which a gold plan might make more sense for a client, but that will never be the case if they're eligible for either 87% cost sharing or 94% cost sharing in a gold plan. And given that this is the last question, uh, I can't do anything. <laughs> I was going to go back to the slide to show you that. So I would say if someone's income puts them eligible for cost sharing at 73% in a silver plan, then I might compare the options at that level of cost sharing to gold. 
But if someone is in that 87% cost sharing or 94% cost sharing, stick with silver because the benefits are better. The cost sharing is it's simply higher than what they would get for a gold plan. Awesome. Thank you. I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay. Ah, I could have done it. Um, so this is me. This is my email. And there are general inquiries. There's Jenny's self cell phone. <laughs> There's Jenny's email address as well. Please, please, please um, let us know what you need. Sometimes just having a second set of eyes on something can make a huge difference. I think that I've learned the most in talking to people in coalitions in Chicago and Missouri and Wisconsin and Maine. I didn't know that some of the issues I was dealing with in Texas were issues everywhere until I started having these conversations. And we're often not able to have these conversations because we have no time. As sisters are very overworked. We know this. Um, so take down my email. Make sure you have the Beyond the Basics email as well. And also Jenny's is there. We're, we're eager and anxious to help. So be in touch. And thank you again. Thank you, Ari, that was great. Um, and just as a reminder, we will be distributing the materials from today's session via email, and we will post everything to the website. The second webinar in the series, Under the Hood, Building Your Own Plan Selection Tools for 2024, is scheduled for Wednesday, August 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can register for this and other upcoming webinars on the Beyond the Basics website under upcoming webinars, and I will also add the link to the chat. You can also find reference charts, guides, and other resources on the website. So like Ari mentioned, if you have any questions, please email our Beyond the Basics contact email at beyondthebasics at cppp.org. And with that, we will bring this webinar to a close. Thank you again for joining us today.